God's going to do something really awesome. To, I mean, he always does something really awesome. That whole carrying heaven into your schools, that carrying him everywhere you go, it's, it's going to be birthed in you in a, in a brand new way tonight. A brand new way. I'm anticipating because the Father is well pleased with you. See, it's amazing. Jesus told the disciples, he said, you guys are already clean through the word I've spoke to you. He told them that. It's so crazy. He talks about eternal life in John 17, and he says, this is eternal life, to know you, the one and only true God. To know God, that's eternal life. Eternal life starts the second that you know him. And it is a walk of knowing him deeper and deeper. But there's a place where you don't just know him, but he knows you. And I don't know if you're aware of what happened this morning. I mean, I, we're partially aware. But what happens when God cleans, when God cleans house, when he cleans house, it's like this, it's like this total internal, like rooting out of all the trash and all the junk. Who helped? Who here today? It was like a different, a different level of cleanliness. Like today, did you, did you sense that all day? Like something's like totally different. This will never leave you. This is where you're meant to live from every day. See, when the power of God, because that's what's going to happen tonight. When the power of God, when the fire of God rests upon that one that's completely yielded and completely clean. See, Jesus came into the temple do you remember when Jesus came and, and they were all like, they were vending and selling things and Jesus was like, this ain't right. And he started flipping tables, right? Well, that is a picture of you being the temple. And that place that he flipped that was the picture of your heart. So what he does when he comes in, he cleans house, man, because God's a jealous God. He doesn't, he doesn't share space with something. So God requires everything to you, Abraham. A perfect example. Abraham had had Isaac, and he was promised this that he was going to have. He was going to have a son that was going to be his heir, but it was going to be like the multitudes, like more than the stars, are going to be blessed by his heir. And he has his son, and like at a hundred years old, he's got this little boy, and this little boy's growing up, and and God saw what was happening, and He saw that Isaac was moving into the center court of his heart in a place where only God could rest. And he told Abraham, you sacrifice your son. Not because he wanted to kill Abraham, not because he wanted to kill Isaac. That wasn't God's plan at all. But he needed to remove what was inside of Abraham's heart. But he, Isaac had taken the place of God in his heart. And God doesn't share place with anything. So God needs to make sure that there's anything inside of you that is bigger and stronger than you believe God is. It has to go so that he can have full capacity inside of you. It's an amazing place to be. It's the only place to be. Because when God, when you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, nothing else tastes good. Unless it has the flavor of him. And it's outrageous. And it doesn't matter how old you are. This is beautiful because I know what God's going to do. He's going to touch you so wonderfully where you're going to be lost in him. But it makes you good at everything. To be lost and to be completely abandoned to God. I mean, this is the place we want to be. See, abandonment to God means not embarrassed by anything else. Like, to be abandoned to God that much is to be in a place of complete humility. It's, it's like, you know what? I can't do this thing without you. And God doesn't want to be without you. He likes to live in you. But not just live in you. He likes to possess you. So you're going to be possessed. He wants you to be possessed to a place where he, like Gideon, it says that he put Gideon on like a glove. It says that God came there and he, and he put on Gideon like a glove. Like he placed himself inside of Gideon and he was like a puppet in the, in the hands of the master. That's an amazing place to be. John the Baptist said this. He said, they came to him and he goes, you know, I baptize you with water. They came to him. And they're like, who are you? Like, why are you doing this? Why do you baptize? Are you Elijah? Are you one of the prophets? What, what are you? Like, come on. Are you the one who was to come? No. 
Were you Elijah? No. One of the prophets? No. Then why do you baptize? And John said, you know, I baptize you with water, but the one that comes after me, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. That's like amazing. Like what? What do you mean fire? Like baptized in fire. Man, I remember the day. I remember the day I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'm not trying to say it's two different things because it's the same, but it intensifies. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and I remember singing in tongues and I I didn't even know what I was singing, but it was really cool. I had no idea. My brain couldn't catch up and it was awesome. Then I just began to always pray in tongues. And then there was a guy named Jason Westerfield that I met one day. He was at a house church. He was just doing a house church. It was up in Harrisburg at a, at a, at a place I was at. And, and I came up to him and I talked to him and he looked at me and he, went, he knelt down and he started praying over my feet, him and his wife. And I'm like, what are they doing? This is weird. Because I didn't know any better. I have no idea. You know, I, no clue. And he said, you need to go to this conference. There's a man named Randy Clark that's going to be there and a man named Bill Johnson that's going to be there. And I'm like, okay. So I, I go to this conference and Randy's there and Bill's there. And I'm like, it's called the voice of healing. And I'm like, or no, healing fusion. Sorry. And I'm just there like at, at the church and I'm sitting in the middle of the congregation. I'm like, this is awesome. Like, look at all these people are so hungry. I'm like, I'm hungry too, but I don't know what I'm hungry for. Because you have no idea. And I had no idea what was about to happen. Because it was going to change everything. Now, I've been praying for all these people and just praying for people. And I was seeing some breakthrough. I was seeing some people healed. And it was awesome. Randy's up there preaching. And, and I'm like, man, I can't even listen to his message. He's, listen, he's talking about healing. But I keep thinking in my heart, like, what about this baptism of fire thing? Like, what does that mean? Because, like, if, it, if it's fire, it's got to look like fire, feel like fire, smell like fire or something. I'm like, I don't have any idea what it is. But I want it. If it's available, I want it. Because like you always hear, are you on fire for God? Are you on fire for God? And zeal is, 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 is fire. But there's a difference between God landing on somebody and burning them. And I was like, man, I want whatever that is. I want it. Because I'm pretty zealous for Jesus, man. I'm like, rah, rah. But, but zealous without like full power is, is hard. Because <laughs> I want all that he's got, you know, rah. And I'm praying for people and I'm not seeing the manifestation that I need. And I'm like, there's got to be something about that fire thing that I'm missing. Right? And I know we lack no good thing, but there's always more. Yeah. And so Randy's up there. He's talking about there's always more. And I'm like, and I drifted off into this fireplace again. Like, literally. Like the place where fire is supposed to rest. And so my life is a sacrifice to God. It says in, in Romans 12.1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God. So it's your only reasonable pleasing, your pleasing service to God is to offer your body from top to bottom, from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Okay? And I've watched you guys over the last couple of days, and you want God, man. And that's all that's required. So all you do is you like, there's this line. It's a scary line because on the other side, you're full in. So people step to the edge and they kind of like, they get their feet wet and they're like, wow, that was crazy. But I, I feel a little bit out of control there. And then people like step a little farther over. Okay. That was kind of cool. I don't really understand what it is, but like, that's pretty neat. But, But God doesn't want us to just do that over the line. He wants us to go way far past that line, way in to where there's no way out. He wants us to be lost in him. And that's the only place to live right there. It's full abandonment. It's full on. It's full on Jesus. It's everything that God wants for you. And honestly, that's the only safe place. That is where God puts you on like a glove. So I'm in this place and I'm up there at this church and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm all in, dude. I'm, I'm in, I'm sold out. There is nothing else. I'm like, that's it. So I'm sitting there and Randy's talking about healing. And all of a sudden I start to like sweat. And it's like not a cold house. It's like an air-conditioned church of like 1,500 people. I'm like, man, I looked at the person that left me. I said, are you, are you feeling that? I'm like, what? I'm like, dude, I'm like, he goes, are you okay? Are you sick? I go, I, I don't think so. But I keep thinking in my heart, what is this baptism of fire thing? And all of a sudden, I start like sweating more. And now it's like not okay. Because now my heart's racing. And I'm like, what's wrong? 
because something feels like it's wrong. Like my heart's beating like really hard. I'm looking beside me. I can hear my heartbeat in my ears. I'm thinking, am I having a heart attack? What's the deal? And all of a sudden it gets worse. And then it's hard for me to breathe. And I'm like, dude, what's going on? And Randy Clark being the calm person that he is, do you know who I'm talking about? Randy just looks around, you know, and he stops and he goes, son, stand up. And I'm like, what? He goes, you've been asking the Lord for a baptism of fire, haven't you? In the middle of the meeting, dude. And I'm like, what? Everybody looks at me, like shaking their head, a couple of people in front of me. And I'm like, and boom, the Holy Spirit hits me and drops me in between the seats. And I'm screaming and think I'm going to die. Shot at, I've been through it. That was the scariest day of my life. I'm screaming. And people are turning, the poor lady in front of me, I'm holding onto her coat and I'm snotting all over it. It's the messiest thing you ever saw, man. It's like I'm being electrocuted. It is the scariest thing ever. Ah, I'm screaming. They have the video over it, you know. And I got the video and I'm screaming and I look sad. And dignity isn't a fruit of the spirit. I'm really glad. Because I was the biggest, yuckiest mess ever. I'm sitting there shaking and trembling. And Randy's up front. He goes, you won't die more, Lord. No joke. And it intensified. And the guys beside me are like moving away from me. Like, are you okay? Are you okay? And people around me are thinking I'm being delivered. But I had already been delivered. I was already free. But God was answering my cry. See, the cry of a heart. See, what are you after? See, it's the cry of your heart. It's the position of your heart. What do you want from God? I mean, how much of Him do you want? Are you cool with the same old, same old? Because God doesn't want you to just be clean. He wants you to be empowered. He doesn't want you to, to, just, to just be a, a clean, moral person. He wants you to be clean, moral, without compromise, and full of power. Because He wants to see a generation arise that would walk without compromise, with no closets, with no secrets with no junk in their closet that wouldn't have to do a miracle to gain who they are, but they would be so thankful just to have God for their reward. So it's, so it's, what are you hungering for? What are you after? Cause man, if you position your heart, if you just dare to position your heart and say, you know what? I don't care what it costs. I want this. That's where it's at right there. And I promise you, the Holy Spirit will fill you and possess you in such a beautiful way. You couldn't ever be embarrassed again. You sit in class. Tremble and shake. And people get around you say, you okay? And they touch you and, oh, in your classroom. That's where it's at. What would happen if your teacher, if you were in school and your teacher called on you to ask you a question? And you stood up and you couldn't hold back anymore. And you proclaimed the gospel. There were people on this earth like, like, well, there's one, Heidi Baker. She's on the earth, man. She's doing such amazing work, but it's because this happened in her life. This happened in her life. Smith Wigglesworth. You couldn't even be in the same room with that man praying. Lest you were going to die until you crawl out. That's like intense, man. That's my longing. That's my desire. I want to be in a steel tube locked at 35,000 feet with people that can't get away. It's where the reality of God in that place is so strong that people have to surrender to the king. It's called presence evangelism. It's where God's presence in you is stronger than anything around you. It's amazing. I've had the freedom in God. I've been free for 10 years. But this thing happened about a year and a half into my life. A year and a half. No, no. Six months into my life that happened. And another year and a half something else happened. But it was the same kind of touch. But it was more. It's like the disciples where they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're baptized in power. They're already doing this stuff. And they're like, give us more, God. We're getting in trouble for this thing. We got beat. We got whooped. And they counted it a joy to get, to get beat with rods, dude. 
These guys got whooped with rods and they were like, give us some more of that stuff, God. Persecution is really easy when you're filled with power. It is. Persecution, unless you, when you're powerless, doesn't happen. It's not happy. It's not good. To suffer for doing good is commendable before God. God wants to be a, us to be a people whose heart and affection is turned towards Him, His presence, His reality. I want to read a scripture that I saw. It's in 1 Timothy. God told me to pray for impartation tonight. He told me to pray to lay hands on you. But it's not for anybody that's not hungry. So don't you dare ask for prayer if you don't want this. Because it's no good for somebody that's not hungry for this. But I promise you, if you would dare position your heart and be hungry for this, why would you not want to turn your school upside down? Why would you not want to turn your house upside down and inside out? Why would you not want to go to family reunions and wreck the whole thing with the gospel? Why would you not want to go shopping with your parents and all of a sudden 12 people are healed before you leave the store? That's how my life is. I didn't come here just to like preach at you. And you didn't hear me preach at you the whole week. The whole week. Because I don't preach at people. My heart, my goal is to preach from a clear conscience. To make sure that when I leave a place, the very thing that's upon my life is upon the lives of others. Because I can't do this by myself. And the only qualification for you is that your heart be clean and that you want more of Him. So, so my question to you is are you ready to be all in or do you want to hold back? Because holding back will kill you. And holding back will kill others that see you. Because the truth is, is that you're supposed to lead by an example. And people see your example and want what you have. It's the silent people around you that don't really say anything, that are watching your life. What would it be like to walk like Jesus in the midst of a perverse and corrupt generation among whom you're supposed to shine as lights? It says to walk worthy of the calling. Walk in the midst, blameless blameless and harmless in the midst of perversity and corruption. To where you're so possessed by the truth of who God is. Just like Daniel. Daniel was so pure in heart, man, that he's placed there in the midst of yuckiness. Joseph, so pure, and he's placed in the midst of yuckiness, man. Joseph goes to jail. He's there for 13 years in prison, man, for something he never did. And God's with him in there. And he comes out of there so honed with the power of God, with the purity of the gospel, that he rises to the top and he's the king's right hand man. That's awesome. That's what kind of generation you are. That's what kind of people you are. You're people that God wants to trust. Your girls, your boys, your men, your women, that God wants to trust with his fullness. That God wants to fill with his fullness. God's not afraid to give you all of him. You can have as much of God as you want. All you got to have is none of you. It's not more of you and less of me. It's all of him and none of you. When I say none of you, it's not that God doesn't want you in the picture, but he wants the, all of you to just be like a glove that he fits inside. Because God doesn't want you completely out of the picture because he wants to use you because you can be the best Jesus to people around you, but you have to be you filled with him. Does that make sense? Because people have said, I must increase, and I must decrease, and he must increase. And that's not scriptural for you. You must die so that you can live. Period. That's totally different. You die to who you were and what you thought. So that you can live to what he says you are. So that you can flow with him and move with him. Because tonight, there's going to be an impartation. of, And God's going to baptize people in fire. He just is. There's no way out of it. Not if you're surrendered, there's not. The only way out is not surrender. The only way out is holding on to you. And what good is that? Why would you want to leave here with you? Why wouldn't you want to leave here? Why wouldn't you want to leave here tomorrow morning? What would it be like for you to go back and vibrate on your bed all night long because you can't even talk? 
What would it be like to just shake and tremble on your bed with the fear of the Lord upon your life? Not afraid of God. Not afraid of God. So in love with God that what people say contrary to that, it doesn't matter anymore. People ask me today, they said, what's the scariest thing you've ever done? And and honestly, I'm not afraid. So I don't know how to answer that one. I'm in situations all the time that would be scary if you're selfish. But it's not scary if you're selfless. If I'm there for the purpose of representing him, I'm not afraid because I'm never going to die. If I hold on to me because I've got reservations and I'm trying to preserve myself and I'm trying to create boundaries so that no one hurts me, you're in trouble and you'll be hurt. If you've got to have boundaries to protect yourself because you've been hurt before, that's not selfless. That's selfish. That's self-preservation. You're trying to hold on to you so that nobody gets into your heart and hurts you again. Dude, that, give that thing up because you'll be hurt. If you can be touched, you will be touched. Does that make sense? If you're touchable, you will be touched. You're not supposed to have buttons. They push my buttons. That's demonic. That's not okay. That's not Christianity. That's demonic activity. It's attitudes. It's not okay to give people a piece of your mind. That's illegal in the kingdom. You give them a piece of his. It's awesome. (laughs) I promise. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. What is that? Dude, that's like twisted. Get over you. Just give up. It's awesome. Give up. This morning, when we shared God's hearts in the room, the conviction of the Lord, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the reality of where you're supposed to live, imagine if the weight of that rested on your life. It's only a short period of time. It's called the cross. What happens is the cross, it cuts through all that junk. It's painful at first, man. It's like, oh, but man, once you're through that, It's rest. Once you're through that place where he cuts through all that stuff, slices, gets to the depth of it, boom, it's gone and you're brand new and you stay that way. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes, he's your best friend and he goes, when something's wrong, it's like, he sniffs that thing out and lets you know it's wrong. And all of a sudden you you get this trembling inside. And then when you step back from it, you realize that was it. And all of a sudden your peace remains. It's an awesome life. It's called Christianity. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I went to, you guys saw the Father of Lights, right? I want to share a couple of testimonies, then I want to share one more time that God really, really touched me, and then we're going to pray. Let me share the scripture that I say everything. It's in Timothy. Did you ever ask Siri to go somewhere in the Bible? She gets really hurt. Ask her questions about Jesus and she freaks out. It says this in in 1 Timothy 4. In verse 12 it says, Let no one despise your youth. Man, I know that you've all seen it where, where people that are older in the Lord they kind of look at you and like you have a lot of growing up to do this just I understand that what that thing is okay and even today I'm only 10 years old and I run I run I run all over the world I, I, I run with with people that have preached for a long time I, I'm, I'm in and amidst of everything I mean I get to to speak with I get to preach. I've traveled with Reinhardt for the last couple of years. Just, it's been amazing the things I've. I get to speak at conferences with amazing, amazing people. But it's never about the amazing people. It's always about the amazing one. And I've been at different places where pastors have have looked at me and listened to me, and they're like, first they're freaked out because I've got dreadlocks and have questions. Why would you grow your hair that way? Why would you wear shorts to preach? What do you? I've had people that that despise that, and it's, it, they think that I'm some some young buck or or some guy that's just getting started, and I'm just burning on fire because I'm new. That's not the fact at all, man. I'm in love with Jesus, but I'm so free from me that I'm free from them. God set me so free from me that I'm free from people. And it's the baptism of fire. It's the reality of the fire of God upon your life. 
that keeps you free. And if you're on fire and you go through the fire, nothing happens to you. Because when you put fire inside a fire, there is no transformation except for a crisper, sharper, more awareness of God. But I'm in all kinds of places and I don't have to respond and try to validate myself or, or vindicate myself because I'm already vindicated. God's the one. Just like I said with Jesus that was, Mary was before Jesus and Martha was, tell her to do this, tell her to do this. Why doesn't she care what she cared? Jesus said, hey, leave her alone. She chose the right thing. And God's the one that vindicates. He's the one that validates you. But it says this, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in the word. In the word, so that means be an example to people that read the word, people that understand the word, people that are in the Bible. I talk all week about the Bible and the importance of the word, and the truth. And we had a great conversation down there in the archery place we were talking today about the Bible, about the word, and about the importance of it. People ask me like, where would you suggest to read? And I said Ephesians. It's one of the easiest books in the whole Bible for me. The Psalms are amazing too. But read it and say, God, I don't understand, but I want to. And God will give you wisdom beyond your years. And people will look at you as somebody that's young and it'll be like Jesus when he was 12 in the temple. And they said, how did this man get this wisdom? What's the deal? He said, well, I'm about my father's business. And you can be young, but be about your father's business. And it says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example in the two, two believers in word, in conduct, which means that we want to be blameless. We want to be a people that are blameless, that are spotless. That doesn't mean perfect, although the Bible says be perfect as your father is. That means to be in love with him and to be so possessed by him that your conduct is the reflection. The word grace means the divine inspiration of God upon the heart with his outward reflection of God upon the life. So grace means his divine inspiration on your heart with his reflection on your life. That's awesome. And it says in conduct, in love. It's not just a, a love for people. It's a love for God. Jesus didn't say to Peter, Peter, do you love my people? When Peter was being restored, he said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. I care for my lambs. Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. It's about your love for God. Then it's your love for yourself. Then it's a love for people. Love God with all you are. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor unless you love yourself. And today, when God cleaned house, that's what enables you to love yourself, to look in the mirror and say, I like what I see. Because God chose you, you didn't choose him. It says, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And that is where you're supposed to rest. So you're supposed to rest yourself in him. In your conduct, in your faith, in purity, in spirit, in love, in word. All that is yours. Don't let anybody despise your youth. Take heed to yourself concerning the doctrine, man. Go after this thing. If I have a word of wisdom, it's to continue in the word. Because what happens is God's going to baptize you with power. It's going to happen. But you have to continually go after him in truth. So, so that you're never, never, ever, ever, ever just, just walking in power. Because the, the power of God will destroy you. You can't afford to make a name for yourself in the deeds that you do. But you have to carry his name in character and power. And it's only... And I guess I want, I want to share all of them. There's millions of them, man. Because they're every day. Some happen today. Do you remember the person... What was her name? Jay? Jay today? Did you tell anybody? Did you talk to anybody about what happened? Yeah, we were just, we were, I was hanging out with Joel. We went down to the office and we prayed for, uh, or talked to a couple of housekeepers and then walked down, talked to a lady in the office and then came back up and that lady, Jay, that was helping out today with, with that, we, I said, do you, you have a problem with your knees? She said, yeah, my right knee, what's going on? You're scaring me. I said, it's not scary, it's Christianity. I said, aren't you a Christian? No. Wow, why not? I said, come on. I said, how about this? I said, how about we pray and Jesus heals your knees? She goes, you're kind of scaring me. I said, stop, it's okay. 
So she's not, I said, you don't even believe. She goes, well, not like the church, not like that. I said, no, I, this is amazing. So we prayed for her and Jesus touches her. She's like, it's pretty good. And we start to walk away and Joel goes, I feel like one of her legs is shorter than the other one. So he says to her, he goes, I, I feel like there's this, your leg is, is shorter. She goes, yeah, it's actually my right one. And your back's messed up. Yeah. Oh man, come here. So we sat her down and she said, what are you going to do? So we're just going to pray for you. So we sat her down and her leg grew out and she got totally freaked out. But then she gave her life to Jesus. Really? Only the Spirit of God will do that in your life. Well, how many of you know Christians at your school that don't act like Christians? Right? They're everywhere. How many of you know, how many of you know adults that don't act like Christians? You should see, listen, you should see, you should see people when my little eight-year-old is walking with me somewhere. And she's, I remember when she's six years old, we're in the airport. Or no, I'll, I'll, yeah, we're, she's seven, we're on the beach, we're just hanging out. And my daughter, Zoe, sees somebody walking by with a neck brace on. She goes, Dad. I go, yeah? She goes, come on. My little girl. I said, I'm not going with you do it. She goes, okay. She runs down the beach. And she's like, she's like 50 yards away, 50 meters away. And, and I see her pull on his hand. He looks down and she points at him and I can tell her what she's saying. What's wrong with your neck? So my little kid's been baptized in fire. She's just a little girl, a little girl. And I see her pointing to his neck. He goes, oh, okay. And I see him like, and he keeps walking. So I know my daughter, she doesn't give up. She doesn't. She pulls his hand. She goes, no, now. He goes, oh, okay. She, he's like trying to be nice. So she prays for him. Father, I thank you. And I see her just praying. Jesus' name, God. Puts her hand up there on the neck brace. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Check it. I can see her. He's like, he walks down the beach. My daughter comes running back. She grabs me and jumps up on me. I'm like, great job. She goes, she goes, that was awesome, Dad. She just runs into the ocean. Because <laughs> that's all she's seen from birth. She doesn't know any better. See, people around you, they might not know any better. But they need to see all that you are from birth. In other words... When you go home from here, it's a totally different world, man. You're going to see things from a totally different perspective. Your eyes are going to see what was normal for you before convict your heart now. And it's not okay anymore. And people that were your friends are going to back away from you because they're going to be freaked out by you. They call themselves Christians and you're not going to be the cool kid anymore. So you can either hold on to cool or you can hold on to him. But who's really cool? Because cool will put you in hell. Being cool and trying to fit in causes people to go to hell. It does. It's not pressure. It's the truth. Everybody that you look at is eternal. So you can either try to fit in or you can be the outcast. But being the outcast with God is amazing. I've been in so many situations with people that despise me and I just won't bow to anything. And I don't sit there and preach at them. I just manifest Jesus. When I get squeezed, Jesus comes out. When you squeeze an orange, what kind of juice comes out? When you squeeze an apple, what kind of juice comes out? If you squeezed an orange into a cup and you saw it and you drank it and it was apple juice, what would you think? Exactly. That's weird, right? It should be equally as strange that when you get squeezed, everything but Jesus comes out. When you get squeezed, Jesus ought to manifest. When you get pressure, Jesus ought to come out everywhere. When the devil squeezes you, bruh, Jesus ought to come out. Boom! And everybody around you is like, oh my gosh, what was that? What would it be like? I know what it's like. It's amazing. Remember the first time my little girl, Destiny, when I, when I was just starting to walk in the power of God after this happened up there at Life Center with Randy and we're praying for people. I saw somebody, we went into Walmart, me and my little girl. Destiny, when she was just young, she's only eight or eight and a half years old. 
my, the one that's 18 now. We walk in and we see this guy on crutches in Walmart in there. And he's standing with the greeter. Well, he's the manager of Walmart. So we asked him what happened. And he said, well, he had polio as a kid. And we said, well, what, what's the deal? What, what's wrong? He said, well, my leg is four inches short. So my daughter looked at me and I looked at him. We never saw a leg grow out before. We're like, well, why don't we try here? First one. So we sat this guy down and I held his leg. Like, that's a big difference. Big. So you're looking at it and the greeter's just standing there and she's kind of embarrassed because we're going to pray. And so my little daughter, Destiny, she prays. She says, leg, I command you grow in Jesus' name. Real like authority. And all of a sudden that leg went. <laughs> and the greeter went. Ah! <laughs> and ran, dude. And the manager's leg grew out four inches right there in Walmart. What would you do? Because this is what's going to happen in your life. So what if that happened? Would you still want to be the cool guy? Because that is so cool. That is so cool. But people get freaked out by this. Freaked out. The church gets freaked out by it. Christians run from it. They're like, you're the devil. No, if I'm praying in Jesus' name and people get healed, if the devil's doing it, we ought to pack our bags and go home, dude. (laughs) If I'm praying for people in the name of Jesus and the devil's healing them, we're in trouble. Because people read the Bible and they're like, not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. And they will say, Didn't we prophesy and didn't we do acts of power and didn't we do this, Lord, in your name? Away from me, I never knew you. That's why we hit what we hit before we pray for this. Because the the purity of the gospel, he said, you who regarded and practiced lawlessness. Because the power of God is a dangerous place. You can't afford to live in lawlessness and to live in twistedness. You can't afford to sleep with your girlfriend or your boyfriend and then manifest the power of God and think you're okay here because you're not okay there. You're okay because you're living and you're pure in heart with God. And he comes in and he makes his home inside of you because he likes to live there. And the power of God and the reality of the kingdom of God squeezes out everything else and makes everything else fruitless compared to the reality of the king. And he flows through you and he touches people around you. Tonight, there's a bunch of people in here that need healing. And you guys are going to pray for each other after we do this. And then God's just going to use you to do it. And I highly suggest that you test this equipment out everywhere you go. God's going to speak to you and give you words of knowledge and prophetic words. I rarely in meetings prophesy over people. It's available, but I rarely do it because I don't want you to be drawn into getting a word from me. I need you to become the word. And I want you to manifest this and you need to be the one giving it. It's cool to receive it, but it's amazing to be the giver of word. It is. Does that make sense? so good all I'm doing is trying to whet your appetite because he is lovely he's amazing so I'll share gosh there's so many okay yeah this is a good one so I went to um, South Africa um, last year have you gone South Africa oh yeah you did with Heidi have you gone I went I went to um, I went I was going there it was it was my second time there. And I'm on the plane and I land in Johannesburg. And when I land in Johannesburg, I have to fly on to Durban. And on my way to Durban, there's like this layover at, this, at, the, at the airport. So I've, it's a long flight to get to where I am. It's like going here. Long. I hadn't slept, stayed up. I get there and I'm in the airport and I'm waiting in line. And my plane is like sitting there there's nobody maintenancing it but they delayed my plane delayed my plane and they're not giving us a reason why and I'm sitting there going okay this is like strange I just I have like another hour to get to where I got to go and have people waiting for me so man what do you do you just pray for people so I'm just I'm praying for people having a great time if I get laid over in airports I just utilize my time and touch as many people as I can in the period of time I have if if my plane gets canceled then I have like a whole long time period to touch people but I utilize the time for his glory in everything I do I'm just always about my father's business I always want to grow in him it's never about trying to be in trying to be in ministry it's always about walking with him everywhere and caring about the one that's in front of you so I'm sitting in line waiting now and and it's about to board we get on the plane and I sit down 
And I'm sitting in, the, in my seat. I'm in the aisle. I try to get in the aisle because I drink so much water. It's not good to be at the window. Because <laughs> you always got to say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. So anyway, I'm sitting there. And this guy gets on the plane. And everybody knows this dude. And I'm like, man, like this guy's like somebody major. Like everybody knows him. He's like really important. Oh, like, I mean, people that are bummed out so are on the flight, like, you know, sad. They see him. They're like, oh, hi. I'm like, man, this guy's like Jesus but not. And so I'm like, everybody, he sits there, he goes to sit down. He's supposed to sit in this seat beside me. He looks at what's sitting beside him and does not want to sit there because it's me. He turned, he goes, things about me in the newspapers. I'm like, no way. Well, what do you, what is it that you do? He goes, well, I'm just a businessman. He goes, what is it that you do? I said, well, I'm a businessman too. So he's like, well, what do you mean? I said, I'm about my father's business. And he's like, well, who's your father? I said, I'm so glad you asked. Because everything is geared towards the gospel. So I was like, my, my dad, I said, his name's God, man. He said, oh, God. Oh, oh, you're a Christian. I said, absolutely. He goes, oh, I'm not. I go, well, why not? He says, because I'm a Hindu. And I said, wow. I said, so you believe in a lot of gods. He's like, yeah. I go, oh, okay. I said, well, man, I said, how about your heart? Your heart's hurting. You have a problem with your heart. Now, I didn't mean spiritually. I meant physically. He goes, no, 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 I'm okay. And he was kind of embarrassed, like he didn't, everybody knows him. He didn't want, like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you anyway. And he turns and he's talking to the guy next to him. And so I'm just sitting there, but something inside of him is crying out for truth. See, all creation is groaning for you to manifest God. And he's like curious. So tell me about Tell me about your story. I'm like, yes. So I share my testimony with him and he is freaked out big time. Cause like, you're talking about a dude that's been in and out of prison, shot at, extradited across America in shackles and handcuffs, man, rebellious and a thief your whole life. And he doesn't even know the end of the testimony. All he knows is like, that's the scariest story I ever heard. And he's never had that cause he's has money. He's never had that happen. But he has his own stuff that he's dealing with. He looks at me and he gets to the end of the story. And he's like, my testimony. He goes, wow, that's amazing. And I looked at the air attendant and I said, hey, I said, you've got some stuff going on in your neck right now, right? It's hurting. She goes, yeah. I said, can I pray for you? She goes, uh, absolutely. So I prayed for her and Jesus touches her. She goes, wow, thank you. This guy beside me, he looks at me like, what's going on? I said, Jesus, man, he lives inside of me. He goes, you are psychic. I said, no, I'm not. He goes, well, how did you know about my heart? I'm like, yes, dude, let me pray for you. He goes, please pray for my heart. So I put my hand on his chest. Now the embarrassment at first is gone because Jesus is invading the atmosphere. It's called manifesting your father. It changes everything. And this is what you're hungry for. This is why you're alive. So this guy, we pray, and he gets all warm in his chest. He's like, wow, this is amazing. Oh, I'm going to the doctors to get checked. I said, man, that's it right there. He goes, we are going to land soon. And when we land, I have somebody meeting me at the end of the jet bridge, and you will let him carry your bag. And I go, dude, it's only a little bag. <laughs> he goes, no, you must. And it's like this power thing because he's a man of power and people listen to him so I'm like okay dude it's only a bag but it's all right I'll, I'll walk with you he goes thank you it will be my privilege I will get your information he goes I have a son that has schizophrenia he says I want you to pray for him do you think that your God will heal my son I said absolutely dude that's a bold statement to make unless you know him it's good to make bold statements in your father and to set father up you create a landing strip called risk. Boom. So we walked to the end of the jet bridge and the guy's there to get my bag. And he's like, just carry his bag. Please don't ask any questions. Okay. The guy's not asking a question. On the way down, we get to baggage claim. And I look at him and I go, you wanted to play rugby, didn't you? Professional. But you hurt your knee and you blame God. And you think he took your knee out. He's like, What? And this guy, Vivian, he goes, this is true. It's true, isn't it? Because he's been watching God touch people. So now he's convinced that God is real. But he doesn't know how to get to him. He just knows that 
that this guy knows him. People are hungry for this. If you manifest your father, you'll see so many people come to Christ. It's awesome. So we get there and he's like, he's like, yes. He goes, I didn't pray for your knee. I prayed for his knee and Jesus heals this guy right there. It's amazing. He's like, yes, this is my new friend. This guy, the guy on the plane that didn't even want to sit next to me. I'm his friend. We get down to the baggage claim. We walk out. We, we get our bags. We walk out. And the pastor that's picking me up knows this dude. Everybody in South Africa knows this guy. He comes up. To, he goes, oh, hey, sir, how you doing? He knows him. He just honors him, gives him a handshake and stuff. He goes, is this man speaking at your church? He says, uh, yeah, he is. He's actually going to be at my church all weekend. He says, well, I'm coming on Sunday. What time is service? He goes, really? Okay. Gives him the time. He goes, what's your cell phone number so I can get a hold of him? He needs to pray for my son. My son is schizophrenic. His God's going to heal my son. This guy, the pastor's like, he gives him his number. He goes, call me. So this guy gives me a hug and walks away. And the pastor looks at me and he goes, do you know who that guy is? I go, it doesn't matter. Don't tell me anything about him. I said, God's doing something amazing. He goes, he must be. It was awesome. So we had the greatest conversation, Pastor and I, because he's just a good man, dude. Just loves Jesus. So we go back, and I stay with the people I'm staying with. The next morning, I do a service, and then after that, I have a break during the day because we didn't set up the three services a day. We only have two. So this guy texts and says, I need to meet Todd. I need him to meet him at this place called the Oyster Box. It's in Durban. It's just this restaurant. So he goes, can he come at this time? I will send a driver to pick him up. And I'm like, tell him that you guys will take me and he doesn't need to send a driver to get me. So he takes, so the pastor takes me, drops me off. I get to this restaurant and he's not there. So he's like running behind. I'm 10 minutes early, 10 minutes later, he's not there. So I just like, I don't have anything else to do. So I'm going to pray for waiters and waitresses. So I just start praying for as many as I can, touching people, just touching people, dude. It's utilizing your time. It's amazing. It's awesome. So good. Because I'm always caring about the one in front of me. It's never about ministry or, or a pulpit. It's always about Jesus that lives inside of this pulpit. So I'm, I'm sitting there praying for you. When he comes in, he goes, hey, Todd, I'm sorry I'm late. I have business. And I said, dude, I'm totally fine. Let's just go sit. So bear with me in this testimony, okay, because it gets amazing. <laughs> really, it's amazing. So we, we sit down, and, and we're sitting outside, and he says, it's too loud. My son won't be able to handle it. We need to go inside. So we go inside and we sit down and he's across the table from me and he's talking to me and just asking questions. And so how did you come to know this God? And I said, man, I just, I, you know, I, I got shot at. Remember when I said that? And I had this encounter and it was just amazing. And I told him about my wife and getting married and wow, so you have a family, you have kids. Yes. He goes, I, I love my son. I can't reach him. And then he looks at me and he goes, uh, we have to move. And I go, why? He said, remember I told you about the newspaper people that they write bad things about me? The reporter, the head reporter for the newspaper is sitting right beside us at the table. I'm like, what a setup. So he goes, we're going to move, okay? And I'm like, yeah. And he stands up and he goes, oh, hi. And he shakes hands with this reporter. He goes, oh, I didn't see you. But he knew and he was writing stuff. So he was like writing something. I'm like, man, he's about to get a good story. He is because it's not, it's not intimidation because God will speak to you if your heart's right. So God speaks to me and tells me this guy has two discs that are bad and his one leg is messed up. He has sciatic pain the whole way down right to here and it's numb from here to here. So I look at this guy and I go, dude, and, and Vivian is away. He walks away. And I said to him, because he doesn't want anything to do with this because this is a guy that writes bad stuff, but I need to restore relationship here because God's always about that. I said to the guy, I said, dude, you have this right here and you have this. He goes, yes. How do you know? I said, because Jesus lives in me. He goes, I'm a Christian. I go, awesome. I go, let me pray for you, man. He goes, okay. So I prayed for him. All that went away. Tears filled the reporter's eyes. And Vivian's standing off to the side. Because there's a lady behind us that has a neck brace on. The lady behind us is at the table. She's watching this man get healed. And she has this thing called dystonia, which is a disease that, that just numbs out your limbs and just makes you weak and sick. And she flew the whole way to Durban from where she lives just so she can get medicine to put a mask or to, to kind of lower the effects of this. But she can't get rid of it because doctors have no cure. But Jesus will take her case. So she's crying. And Vivian, she's with Vivian. After my friend gets done with, with him, he'll be here to help you. So he's standing by the table waiting. 
The dude is like saying hi to Vivian, and Vivian's like, it's so nice. I'm so glad that, that his God touched you. And all of a sudden, this lady, we walk over to the table, and she's crying. And I just knelt on the floor and prayed for her. She took her neck brace off. She was completely healed from top to bottom. Completely healed. This is what it means to be clothed with God. To be smeared with God. See, the thing is, is God will produce a hunger inside of you that anything less doesn't taste good. But you manifesting your Father. Because what would it be like for you to... See, it doesn't... I don't feel God. That's, that's, that's the thing. Is I rarely feel God. Rarely in my life have I felt Him. Only a couple times and it's been really scary for me. But I, but I know Him. So it's never about your feelings. And as a matter of fact, when you feel like it's kind of scary here, it's time to manifest Him. When I feel like this, this is like, wow, this is a little bit, this is a little bit freaky here. Okay, time to step into faith here. Boom. And manifest Him. And all that stuff just goes yank, just out the window. It's gone. So I'm sitting there praying for this lady. She gets healed and Vivian's son walks in. So he said, there's my son. I talked to this lady. She's already born again. She's already spirit filled. What time is it? Okay. We're all right. I'm almost there. Okay. So we walk over, walk to the table, and Vivian looks at me and he goes, pray for my son. And I said, Vivian, I will not pray for your son until I can share my Jesus with him. He looks at me and he goes, whatever you have to do, just, just pray for him. I said, I will. And I looked at him and the kid's like, just spaced out, man. He's gone upstairs. He's not there like he needs to be. Because he's schizophrenic and bipolar, suicidal and all that junk. That's the kind of stuff I was dealing with my whole life. But God cured me and healed me of that. So God surely is going to cure him. So I shared the gospel with him. And clarity starts to fill his eyes. And his Hindu son gets born again at the table right in front of his dad. Now this father is a father of power. He can't fix his kid, but my Jesus fixed his kid. So now... His son is clear. He looks at his dad. He's dad. And, and his dad is so confused right now. Because all the power and all the money in the world and all the, all the stuff and all the business and all that stuff, none of it can fix this. None of it. And he looks at me and he says, man, for 12 years I've been, I've been searching and I've been running from here to there and I don't know. I just, I said, man, you need my Jesus, man. And he looks at me and he goes, I, uh, I, I said, no, 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 nothing. You need Jesus, man. You need to be born again. You, the one that knows everything, the one that you've witnessed for days now. It's time. He looks at me and he goes, I will give my life to this Jesus. And this Hindu man of power gives his life to God, gets born again right there in the restaurant. In the midst of, a, in the midst of where you wouldn't even think it would happen. Right there, man. Waitresses and waiters are healed. He starts calling people from his work that are sick to come in to get prayer at this restaurant, man. And he is totally overwhelmed. He says, listen, I, I need to get back to work. I'm coming to church in the morning to see you. He goes, I'm, I'm so thankful. So he comes to church the next morning and just gets really touched by God. Brand new Christian, man. Totally changed. I mean, his life is transformed. I get a call on Monday morning. Uh, it's him. He texts the pastor. He goes, I'm on my way to pick up, send a driver to pick up Todd. He needs to come to my house to share this truth with my whole family. So they pick me up in this Rolls Royce called the ghost. <laughs> I turn my cell phone on and I'm filming the guy in the front seat. He's a Hindu guy. And I said, hey, man, I said, you've got stuff in your right shoulder and your left knee and your right ankle. It's messed up right now. He goes, I heard about you. <laughs> So pray for him and Jesus touches him and heals him the whole way through. The whole way through. God touches him. He goes, you, you serve God. I said, I do, man. He's a good God, isn't he? I said, he is. You need him. This is what Christianity is supposed to be like. People look at me and say, dude, there's something special about your life. I'm in love with God. That's what's special. But he desires that all people have the same thing. I went to his house and shared with his wife. And her Hindu father. She told me when I walked in. My kids are allowed to worship whoever they want. They can worship the cows. They can worship the trees. They can worship Mary. Anything they want to worship. No one's going to change that. I said alright. I said I'm not here to change that. I'm here to share my heart with you. So I shared my testimony. And she started to cry. 
See, in the Hindu, in the Hindu faith, they have gurus, and 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 sometimes and sometimes they do things that they shouldn't to young girls. And so she went through that when she was a young girl, and she was taken advantage of by a guru, by one of the people that was over her religiously. And she said she couldn't block it out anymore; that it was tormenting her every night. I said, "You need my Jesus." So she got born again and got saved right there in the house, man. The whole family, boom. Jesus just leveled the house. Why? God wants to put you before kings. He wants to put you before royalty. He wants to put you into certain jobs in really twisted businesses. And he wants you to be there. And he wants you to be able to manifest the kingdom and transform the whole place because you can't bear to hold Christ in you back anymore. God wants to land upon you and he wants to smear you with his presence and he wants you to represent him in this world. I have so many testimonies that are just like that one. But God's waiting for people that would hunger for him. He wants to baptize you. Are you hungry? For this, because what I explained today will be a normal life for you. That's just one testimony. My life is full of them. I didn't share a whole lot of testimonies when I was here. I shared a lot of truth, man. But I watched what God did today. And I know what God told me he's going to do tonight. So my question is this. Are you hungry for this in your life? It says to show yourself as an example to the believers in word and conduct, love and spirit, faith and purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Don't neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things and give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself. And to the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those that hear you. That means that if you have a family that's not saved, you take heed to this thing. You grow in him. You hunger for this. You you continue in the word. And you run after Jesus. And your whole family will come into the kingdom. Almost my whole family saved. Almost my whole wife's family saved. And I came into this thing the first one born again. And they all persecuted me. And they all told me that we hate what you have. And now one by one, they're all coming in. None of them are going to get out of this thing. And I'm not just proclaiming that for my family. I'm proclaiming that for yours. This is what you need to have your family get saved. So if you want your family born again, if you want your friends at school born again, And you're hungering for this thing in your life. I'm not saying that it's easy. It's a fight of faith. But it's way easier when you're just a glove that God lives in. So my question is this. Do you want this? Because if you do, I want you to stand to your feet.